I'm going to focus the reading today on the Barbizon, the hotel that set women free. Personally, I never lived in this residential hotel, but as a college student, I occasionally visited my great aunt Lydia, who did. By way of background, I'm going to read a bit about Lydia Kent Burr from my own mem memories revisited to give you a sense of the mindset with which I approached the Barbizon as a visitor in the early 1950s when the establishment was at its prime. My personal memories of my great aunt Lydia are very fond. She was indeed a tiny lady who commanded great respect. As a widow, she lived in New York City at the Barbizon Hotel. And no frills, but highly respectable hostelry for women mostly occupied in the 1950s by young ladies just starting out on their careers, in her 80s, Aunt Lydia was something of an affectionately regarded anomaly. My Thanksgiving and spring breaks from Wellesley College were usually spent on Long Island with friends gracious enough to invite this footloose and money-strapped Californian to stay in their homes. Invariably, armed with written to and fro travel instructions from that my hostess, with some trepidation, I would take on the public transportation system for the privilege of visiting my charming relative. By prearrangement, those visits usually included luncheon at a nearby French restaurant, where the welcome according, accorded her clearly indicated that Aunt Lydia was a beloved regular. Upon returning to her apartment, on several occasions she opened a small trunk and invited me to choose for my own one of the many lovely evening bags she had collected on excursions with Uncle George. The bags were mementos of a fascinating life privileged by travel. Almost 70 years later, I still treasure one or two, which have traveled even further with Tom and me. The book. Reading Paulina Brand's book about the hotel, it is quite obvious, because of her advanced age, that Aunt Lydia was an atypical res resident. Never having had children of her own, I suspect she observed the young things who surrounded her with a combination of amusement and amazement. Let's take a look. Who was the woman who stayed at New York's famous Barbizon Hotel? She could be from anywhere, just as likely from small town America as from across the George Washington Bridge. But more often than not, she arrived in a yellow checker cab because she didn't know how to use the New York subway. She had the address on a piece of paper in her hand, and she carefully read it aloud to the taxi driver. The Barbizon Hotel, 140 East 63rd Street. But in all likelihood, the taxi driver knew where she was going even before she spoke. Perhaps he noticed how she timidly waved down his cab, or how she tightly held on to the handle of her brown suitcase, or how she wore her Best clothes, this out-of-town girl, newly arrived in Manhattan. The piece of paper was most probably crumpled by now, or certainly a worse for wear, having traveled with her by train, by bus, or even by plane if she was lucky or well off. Or if, like Sylvia Plath and Joan Didion, she was a Mademoiselle magazine contest winner. The rush of excitement and this young woman walked through the front doors of the Barbizon. It would be impossible to replicate later in life because of what it meant in that moment. She had made her escape from her hometown and all the expectations, or none, that came with it. She had left that all behind, resolutely. 
Often after months of pleading, saving, scrimping, plotting, she was here now in New York, ready to remake herself, to start an entirely new life. She had taken her fate into her own hands. Throughout the years, magazine advertisements for the Barbizon Hotel exclaimed, oh, it's great to be in New York, especially when you live at the Barbizon for women. The tagline was always the same, reassuring in its tenacity, New York's most exclusive hotel resident for, residence for young women. But magazine pieces also warned of the wolves, those men who roamed New York streets on the lookout for pretty, naive young things. And the Barbizon promised both protection and sanctuary. Yet that wasn't the only reason America's young women wanted to stay there. Everyone knew the hotel was packed full with aspiring actresses, models, singers, artists, and writers. And some had already gone from aspiring to famous. When Rita Hayworth posed for Life magazine in the hotel's gymnasium, looking both sexy and impertinent. She was signaling those possibilities. But first, this new arrival had to get past Mrs. May Sibley, the assistant manager and front desk hawk, who would look her over and ask for references. She had to be presentable, preferably attractive, and with letters attesting to her good and moral character. Mrs. Sibley would quietly mark her as an A, B, or C. A's were under the age of 28, B's were between 28 and 38, and C's, well, they were over the hill. More often than not, the girl from out of town with a Sunday school hat and a nervous smile was an A. This initial hurdle was the easy one, however. Once Mrs. Sibley had approved of her and <clears throat> handed her a key, a room number, and a list of the do's and don'ts, the new Barbizon restaurant resident would take the elevator up to the floor with her room, her new home, where no men were allowed, ever, and contemplate what to do next. The room was a step up, to, up for some and a step down for others. But for all the young women of the Barbizon, the narrow bed, dresser, armchair, floor lamp, and small desk in a tiny room with a floral bedspread and matching curtains represented some sort of liberation, at least at the beginning. The Barbizon tells this book, the story of New York's most famous women's hotel from its construction in 1927 to its eventual conversion into multi-million dollar condominium in 2007. It is a, at once a history of the singular women who pass through its doors, a history of Manhattan through the 20th century, and a forgotten story of women's ambition. The hotel was built in the Roaring Twenties for the flocks of women suddenly coming to New York to work in the dazzling new skyscrapers. They did not want to stay in uncomfortable boarding houses. They wanted what men already had, exclusive club residences, residential hotels with weekly rates, daily maid service, and a dining room instead of the burden of a kitchen. Other women's hotels sprang up in the 1920s too, <clears throat> but it was the Barbizon that grabbed hold of America's imagination. It would outlast last most of the others, in part because it was associated with young women, and later in the 1950s with beautiful, desirable young women. The hotel was strictly women only, with men allowed no further than the lobby on weekend nights, called Lover's Lane, as couples hovered in the shadows, embracing behind the foliage of strategically placed potted plants. The reclusive writer J.D. Salinger, while no wolf, 
hung around the Barbizon coffee shop and pretended to be a Canadian hockey player. Other men because became unusually tired and needed to rest up at the very moment when they crossed Lexington Avenue at 63rd and the Barbizon lobby seemed a perfect place for respite. Malachi McCourt, brother of the author of Angela's Ashes, as well as a handful of other men, claimed to have made it up the stairs to the carefully policed bedroom floors while others tried and failed, dressing up as plumbers and on-call gynecologists, much to the amusement and wrath of Mrs. Sibley. The Barbizon's residence read like a who's who, Titanic survivor, Molly Brown, actress, Grace Kelly, Tippi Hedren, Liza Minnelli, Ali McGraw, Candace Bergen, Felicia Rashad, Jacqueline Smith, and Sybil Shepherd, writers Sylvia Plath, Joan Didion, Diane Johnson, Gail Green, Ann Bailey, Mona Simpson, and Meg Wallister, designer Betsy Johnson, journalist Peggy Noonan, and Lynn Schur, and many more. But before they were household names, they were among the young women arriving at the Barbizon with a suitcase, reference letters, and hope. Some of them had their dreams come true, while many did not. Some returned to their hometowns, while others holed up in their Barbizon rooms and wondered what had gone wrong. Each of them expected her stay to be temporary, a soft landing until she had established herself, given voice to her ambitions or aspirations. But many found themselves th still there year after year. These holdouts would become known as the, to the younger residents as the women. Harbingers of what was to come they did not move on and move out. In the 1970s, as Manhattan temporarily returned from Blitzy to derelict, the women gathered nightly in the lobby to comment on the younger set, offering them unsolicited advice on the length of their skirts and the wildness of their hair. They had even more to say when in the 1980s, no longer able to support the original vision of a women-only sanctuary, management opened the hotel to men. But despite their threats to leave, the women remained. When Manhattan remade itself into a hot property market and the Barbizon underwent its own last reimagining from hotel to luxury condominium building, the women got their own refurbished floor where the remaining few still live still live in 2021 when this book will be published, in what is now called Barbizon 63. They have their mailboxes alongside another current resident, British actor and comedian, Ricky Gervais. The Barbizon Hotel for Women, when it opened its doors in 1928, never needed to say it was intended for white middle and upper class young women. The address on the Upper East Side said it. The advertisements depicting a typical resident said it. The required re reference letters of a certain kind said it. But in 1956, a student at Temple University, a talented artist and dancer by the name of Barbara Chase, appeared at the Barbizon. She was most likely the first African-American to ever stay at the hotel. Her time there was without incident. Although she was shielded not only by her good looks and accomplished resume, but also by Mademoiselle magazine. The magazine's editor-in-chief, Betsy Talbot Blackwell, a force in New York's publishing world, had brought her to New York for the month of June as one of the winners of the magazine's prestigious guest editor program. No one was sure if the Barbizon management would let Barbara Chase in, but they did, even if they failed to mention the swimming pool in the basement. 
back in the Mademoiselle office on Madison Avenue, Betsy Talbot Blackwell would usher Barbara out of the room when Southern clients showed up to meet with that young, year's young guest editor. The Barbizon and Mademoiselle magazine were in many ways symbiotic, catering to the same kind of women, being at the forefront of change, often radically so, often to find themselves eventually overtaken by shifting interests and priorities among the very women to whom they catered. It was therefore impossible to tell the story of the Barbizon without also stepping along the corridors of the Mademoiselle offices. In 1944, Betsy Talbot Blackwell had made the decision that the winners of the guest editor program brought to Manhattan in, for June to shadow the magazine's editors by day and to indulge in fancy dinners, sparkling galas, and sophisticated cocktail parties by night must stay at the Barbizon. The contest attracted the creme de la creme of young college women and opened the Barbizon doors to the likes of Joan Didion, Meg Wolitzer, and Betsy Johnson. But it was Sylvia Plath, Mademoiselle's most famous guest editor, who would also bring the greatest notoriety to the hotel. <clears throat> Ten years after her stay there, and shortly before her final successful suicide attempt, she would disguise the Barbizon as the Amazon, spilling out its secrets in her famous novel, The Belgian. The brainy guest editors, Mademoiselle's contest winners, shared the hotel with students from the iconic Catherine Gibbs Secretarial School, who resided across three floors of the hotel with their own house mothers and curfews and teas. These young women, in their white gloves and perfectly perched hats, regulation attire for a girl, Gibbs girl, were synonymous with the new opportunities for the small town girl who could not act, sing, or dance her way to New York, but who sure could type her way out of her hometown and into the glitz and glamour of Madison Avenue. But it was the presence of models, first working for the Powers Agency and then many escaping to the new Ford Agency, run by two daring women out of a shoddy brownstone solidified the Barbizon's reputation as a dollhouse. Yet behind the walls in which these serial dating, kitten-heeled glamour women resided, there was also disappointment. Writer Gail Green returned to the Barbizon two years after her initial stay there as a guest editor alongside Joan Didion, this time to document, document everyone who wasn't considered a doll. She called the overlooked residents the lone women. Some were lonely enough to commit suicide, often on Sunday mornings, because as one of the women, the women noted, Saturday night was date night or not. And Sunday was sorrow. The Barbizon management, Mrs. Sibley and manager Hugh J. Connick, made sure the suicides were hushed, seldom appearing in the papers. They knew that appearances mattered above all else, and it was better to advertise the Barbizon's most glamorous resident, Grace Kelly, than it was to advertise the forlorn. By the time the Barbizon opened its doors to men, the very promise upon which it had been built that women's ambitions, however large or small, could best be supported by single-sex residences with daily maid service and no chance of being pushed back into the kitchen because there wasn't one. Seeming outdated. So why do I wish a place like this had existed when I came to New York after graduating from college? And why do women-only spaces, supportive of women's ambitions, keep springing up? Women did not come to the Barbizon to network, but that's what they did anyway. 
They helped each other find work. They talked over problems with one another. They applauded each other's successes and gave solace to those with disappointment and heartache. They felt empowered just by being at the Barmesan. Actress Ally McGraw, a resident in the summer of 1958, recalls cradling her morning coffee in its paper blue and white Greek coffee cup, feeling like she was going somewhere just by being there. The Barbizon tells a story that, until now, has been heard only in snippets. When I first set out to write about this unique hotel and the remarkable women who passed through its doors, I did not realize before me had that others before me had wanted to tell the story of the Barbizon and then given up. Like them, at first I too hit a wall in my research. There were just too few sources about the hotel. At the New York Historical Society archive, where I expected to find a stack of documents, I was handed only a thin folder marked Barbizon, with nothing more than a few newspaper articles. There are also too few sources about the kind of women who stayed at the Barbizon. The women in between, one might say. Those who were neither upper class, letter writing society women, nor union organizing working class women. Of course, these archival and historiographical gaps I encountered tell, I encountered tell us something. They tell us how the memory of women's lives is easily forgotten and how the silence can make us believe that women were not fully participating in everyday life throughout the 20th century. But they were, very much so, in creative ways and with ambitious plans. I learned this as I slowly began to unravel the Barbizon's hidden story as a historian interviewer, and internet sleuth. I located its former residents, now lively, funny, and sharp-minded ladies in their 80s and 90s. I found scrapbooks, letters, photographs. I even discovered an archive in Wyoming. Together, they reveal the history of single women of a certain sex, of what it meant for them to finally have a room of their own and the air to breathe, without the burden of family and family expectations in New York, the city of dreams. The Barbizon Hotel was about the remaking of oneself, and nothing like it had existed before or has since. Reading Paulina Brand's book about the hotel, it's quite obvious because of her advanced age, that my Aunt Lydia was an atypical resident. Never having had children of her own, I suspect she observed the young things who surrounded her with a combination of amusement and amazement. Let's take a look. And now some snippets about those young women who responded so comfortably to the uniqueness of the Barbizon when it opened 1927. It was the Barbizon Hotel that truly captured America's imagination. It would become the go-to destination for young women from all over the country determined to give their New York dreams a shot. Whereas the Allerton and the AWA were built for professional career women, the Barbizon targeted a different kind of guest. She was the debutante who couldn't tell her parents she wanted to paint. She was the shop girl from Oklahoma who dreamed of the Broadway stage. She was the 18-year-old who told her fiancé she would be right back. At first, there was a typing course she needed to take. The hotel would come to embody an entirely different persona from the others as a place of glamour, desire, and young female ambition. Molly Brown. 
a most significant early exception to those descriptors was 59-year-old resident, suffragist, and activist Margaret Tobin Brown, who as a famously undaunted survivor of the Titanic sinking, had been dubbed the, uh, dubbed the unseekable Molly Brown. And then we have the Mademoiselle connection and Betsy Talbot Black Blackwell. Although not a Barbizon resident, as editor-in-chief of Mademoiselle magazine and strong promoter of the Barbizon Hotel, her influence on its success is notable. There were two types of office-bound women. There were the secretaries who flooded New York's shiny new skyscrapers in the 20s and then, hung on, and then hung on as best they could through the Great Depression. And then there were the women who had not just jobs but careers. Betsy Talbot Blackwell, or BTB, as she signed herself, was one of them. She wore a hat at all times, without fail, so much so that one newspaper claimed she even wore it in the bathtub. She would pull out the scotch at 5 p.m. when the sun is over the yard arm, she'd say. She, she was a Republican amid a sea of New York liter liberal literati who were her staff. While women were still climbing their way into the workforce, grasping one widely spaced rung at a time. There was a handful of women in the 1930s and 40s that already had seats at the men's table. Blackwell, editor-in-chief of Mademoiselle, was one of them. BTB directed so many other career women, her employees, her protégés, her readers, to the Barbizon, that she would tie the reputation of Mademoiselle Magazine to the hotel forever, so that the fate of one followed that of the other, and the hallways of one became shelter as well as testing ground for generations of ambitious women. And then we have Pearl Harbor and women at war in wartime. Men left for war, and women were now expected to take over their jobs, even as before they had been reprimanded for it. When General Wild Bill Donovan put out a call for women to come work for the Office of Strategic Services, the predecessor of the CIA, he explained the ideal employee would be a cross between a Smith College graduate, a Powers model, and a Katie Gibbs secretary. He might as well have come right over to Mrs. May Sibley at the front desk and asked for a Barbizon resident. Actress Grace Kelly is certainly to be highlighted as a Barbizon resident dedicated to making her way as an actress. While Grace Kelly did not have to worry about money, she did have to worry about her parents, who were clearly waiting for her to fail or give up. When she returned from the holidays back to the Barbizon, Grace thus made doubly sure she not, did not do either. Her voice was a problem. She was told by her acting teachers, too high-pitched, too nasal. But like her friend Carolyn, she knew how to fix a problem. She bought herself a wire recorder and sat into her, in her room, speaking into the machine and playing back her voice until she had corrected her speech and acquired that oddly transatlantic, British-like accent, mandatory for all actors at the time. No doubt unkindly, because so many very attractive young women lived there, the Barbizon 
was disparagingly referred to by some as the dollhouse. Author Paulina Bren were to disagree. Altogether, there was something genuinely resourceful about these post-war young women. Many residents were putting money aside for further training, such as 17-year-old Helen Sinclair, with a drawl as broad as her native Texas, who was working for $300 a week as a fashion magazine model so she could save enough to return to college for a fashion art degree. Kathleen Carnes from Detroit sang jingles to pay for voice lessons, and San Antonio's Dorothy White taught music appreciation in New York suburbs to pay for her piano studies. Joan DeBay Murchison from Kewanee, Illinois, started a publicity firm with earnings from a television gig. And Claire McQuinlan from Pennsylvania used her modeling fees to study art and head out as a freelance advertising artist. Barbizon manager Hugh J. Connor took all these accomplishments and promotions as shared victories, sending flowers to those who had gotten their break, particularly if he knew how tough the road getting there had been. He smiled wi widely when sharing good news of Barbizon residents who went from sales clerks to buyers, from receptionists to magazine cover girls, from secretaries to company executives. The Barbizon dollhouse might well have been full of young, beguiling beauties, but there was much more behind their attractive facade. Even if many of these young women would indeed end up as wives and mothers back in the towns from which they had come, their goals while in New York were as ambitious as Betsy Talbot Riley. Betsy Talbot Blackwell created the Mademoiselle College Board, which engaged student representatives from colleges throughout the country as a resource to report to the magazine trends and interests and consumable desires of young women. Translated to features and articles, this invaluable information produced a singular attraction for potential buyers, and the magazine soared in popularity. Next came BTB's prestigious guest editor. Mademoiselle Guest Editor Program was the most sought after launching pad for girls with literary and artistic ambitions. Throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, college dormitory rooms were busy with girls working on essays and short stories and artwork they hoped Mademoiselle would publish, or better yet, would make them a summer guest editor. If you were lucky enough to be one of the chosen 20, you were brought to New York for the month of June to shadow senior editors at Moselle and to stay, of course, at the Barbizon Hotel for women. Certainly, Betsy Talbot Blackwell was the driving force behind Mademoiselle. The link between the ma magazine and the Barbizon Hotel was mutually beneficial for a time but times were to change. Ironically, it would be the onset of the 1960s women movement, women's movement that would sound the death knell for the Barbizon. The residential hotel built in the 20s on the promise of women's independence and the nurturing of their artistic talents and all-around ambition would become a casualty of that very same goal. The movement would call into question the need for sequestering women. What was the line between 
aiding women's growth and independence in a no-man environment, protecting them in a man-free zone, and cloistering them from the world and its gender's reality. Change was in the air. I won't go into the steady decline of the Barbizon in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Eventually, it was re-envisioned as condominium. The final chapter of the book sums up The Barbizon, through much of the 20th century, had been a place where women felt safe, where they had a room of their own to plot and plan the rest of their lives. The hotel set them free. It freed up their ambition, tapping into desires deemed off-limits elsewhere, but imaginable, realizable, doable in the city of dreams. I, must, I guess Aunt Lydia must have been one of the women, but I, I don't envision her sitting on a balcony <laughs> gossiping about the girls down below. 